Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Attorney Job Vlogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today I'm going to be talking about extinguishment of obligations. Specifically, in part 1 of this series, I'm going to be talking about payment or performance. Now if you've been enjoying my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Okay? Now, before I proceed, I would like to inform my regular viewers that this series should be taken merely for educational or informative purposes only and should not serve as a substitute for proper legal advice. Okay, and for my students, I would like to reiterate that this is merely additional learning material and cannot be used as a substitute for actually reading and studying the law. Okay, now let's move on. Payment or performance is defined by the law as the delivery of money or the performance in any other manner of an obligation. Okay? So, the first principle we have to understand is that it is the debtor who has the burden to prove that payment has been made. Okay? So, when do we know payment has been made? Here are the following principles. First, okay, a payment has two requisites, identity and integrity. Let's go first to identity. When it comes to identity, it must be the object or prestation itself which has to be delivered by the debtor to the creditor. Okay? If the object is a specific thing, the debtor cannot compel the creditor to receive a different object, even if such different object is of the same or higher quality. Okay? Now, if the thing is indeterminate or generic, then the creditor cannot ask for a thing of superior quality and the debtor cannot uh, compel the creditor to receive a thing of inferior quality. Okay? Now, there is a special rule of payment where the object itself need not be delivered. And this is called dation in payment or dation en pago. Okay? So, what is this dation in payment? It is the conveyance or transfer of ownership in payment or satisfaction of a debt in money. For instance, a debtor has a debt of 100,000 pesos and in order to satisfy the same, he delivers his car to the creditor. If the creditor accepts, then the obligation is extinguished because the creditor has considered the car as payment. Okay? In such a case, dation in payment shall be governed by the law on sales because it is actually a sale. Okay? Let's move on to the other uh, aspect, no? Integrity. When we say integrity, payment must be complete in order to be valid. In other words, a creditor cannot be compelled to accept partial payments. However, this general rule is subject to exceptions. First, if there is an express stipulation, such as when the obligation is to be paid in installments, then necessarily that is payment in partial uh, installments. Okay. Now, second exception. If there has been substantial performance, but the substantial performance by the debtor must have been done first in good faith and should only involve a slight deviation, meaning the difference is only negligible or so very small that it does not affect the main obligation, and there has been no intentional departure by the debtor from the intent or cause of the obligation. Okay? Final exception is when the creditor accepts the partial performance with actual knowledge of the defect. In such case, it is akin to a waiver wherein the creditor says, okay, that is uh, good enough. Okay, let's move on to the second principle. Payment must be made by the person who is uh, obligated under the obligation. Okay, and who is this? Payment must be made by the debtor. In other words, the creditor is not bound to accept payment by a third person who has no interest in the obligation. Now, this general rule is subject to an exception if there is an express stipulation to the contrary. In other words, if the parties had agreed that payment can be made by a third person, then it will be valid. Okay, so what are the rules in case creditor accepts payment uh, from a third person? Okay, first, if payment by the third person was with the knowledge of the debtor, then that th third person can compel the creditor to subrogate him in the creditor's rights. And that third person can ask reimbursement from the debtor. Okay, 
what is this subrogation? It simply means that the third person can ask the creditor or, or, or compel the creditor to transfer whatever rights, rights the creditor has over the obligation. Such as if the creditor has a mortgage or a guarantee constituted in his favor, then that third person, by virtue of payment with knowledge of the debtor, can compel that creditor to subrogate him or to transfer those rights to him. Okay? Now, what if payment by the third person was without the knowledge of the debtor? Then, the third person can only recover in recover reimbursement only in so far as it has redounded to the benefit of the debtor. He cannot ask for more. Kung saan lang nag-benefit si debtor. But the more important implication is the third person cannot compel the creditor to subrogate him in his rights. Okay? Di na makukuha ni third person yung rights ni creditor over the mortgage, over the guarantee, or any other right. Okay? Now, payment must be made to the person who is entitled to receive it under the obligation. Okay? That's the next principle. Okay? In other words, who is the person entitled to receive payment? It is only either the creditor himself, his successors in interests, or the person authorized by the creditor to receive payment. Okay? Now, that this uh, implies that payment by the debtor to a third person is in general not valid. Okay? However, there is an instance when uh, the payment to a third person will be valid and this, as, this is when the benefit has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. When payment has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. Okay? So again, the general rule is the payment must be made to the creditor and payment cannot be made to a third person unless it has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. So how do we know that the creditor has benefited? The law establishes presumptions in our favor to make it easier. First, no? When the third person acquires the creditor's rights. Okay? Second, when the creditor ratifies, okay, or recognizes the payment to the third person. Next, when by the creditor's conduct, the debtor had been led to believe that the third person had authority to receive the payment. Okay? In those cases, payment to a third person may be valid. Okay? Finally, the law says that payment in good faith to a person in possession of the credit will extinguish the obligation. Okay? Let's move on now to the third major principle. How must payment be made? Okay? First, we follow the stipulation of the parties. If the parties had agreed that payment would be made in a certain currency, let's say uh, payment should be made in Japanese uh, yen, then that stipulation must be followed. Okay? Now, in the absence of an express stipulation, payment must be made in legal tender. And what is legal tender? Simply put, it is the uh, currency which the debtor must pay and the creditor must accept. Okay? The, the, the debtor can be compelled to pay and which the creditor can be compelled to accept. Okay? That is legal tender in a nutshell, no? Now, moving on. What about checks, no? Or uh, bills or uh, promissory notes? Does, uh, do, these, uh, do these instruments produce the effect of payment? As a general rule, no, they do not accept payment, okay? Unless they have been encashed or through the creditor's acts, they have been impaired, Okay? So, mere acceptance by the creditor does not uh, produce payment. It is only when the creditor has been able to encash the same. Regardless of it is whether uh, designated as a manager's check or whatever other uh, designation, they will not produce the effect of payment until they have been encashed. Okay? So, uh, one more important point is under uh, the, root, the law of uh, BSP, no? Uh, coins constitute legal tender. Okay? 
coins below 25 centavos are valid as legal tender up to 100 pesos only. While coins of uh, 1 peso denominations above are valid up to 1,000 pesos. So if a cashier refuses your payment of 1,000 pesos consisting of 1 peso coins, you may have legal ground to claim that that is legal tender and she must accept it. Okay? Okay. Now, let's uh, pass on briefly on extraordinary inflation or deflation. This uh, contemplates a situation such, uh, such as in uh, after World War II where people in Germany were throwing money out their window in order for their uh, relatives to catch it to buy bread. This was because the price of bread was fluctuating so fast that they could not get money out right in time to meet the actual price of the bread. Okay, in this situation, what will be the legal currency or legal tender contemplated? That legal tender which was in place at the time of the constitution of the obligation will be governing. Okay? Now, finally, let's move on to where payment must be made. Okay? In general, we follow the stipulation of the parties. If the parties had agreed on a certain place where payment must be made, then that is the place of payment. In the absence of stipulation, then payment must be made where the determinate thing is situated. Kung nasaan yung bagay na yun. Okay? And finally, in the absence of the first two, then payment shall be made at the domicile of the debtor. Okay? So that's it for the basic principles of, principles of payment. And uh, please uh, wait for my next video on application of payments, session, and tender of payment and consignation, otherwise known as the special rules of payment. Okay? So it's been fun. See you.